and their moms and dads. This week we're going to share a little bit about behavior and one of the most frequently asked questions I get is what is normal behavior? Um, I like to start with talking about our developmental stages because it's a good foundational space to start. Eric Erickson um, speaks about all of us being in a different stage of development and children between the ages of 6 and 12 years are in the stage of industry versus inferiority. So each developmental stage has a goal, something we need to achieve, but it also has a struggle that falls within that stage. So these little children are very much concrete learners um, and they define their sense of self in terms of I am what I learn. So they are wanting to achieve mastery in tasks, in learning new things. They're hungry to learn new things um, and to develop in that a, an independence and a step further independence away from their parents. So in this stage, you might experience a little bit of a struggle or resistance when you're trying to help your child with homework or um, just teaching them how to do something for the first time because they're wanting to learn, they're wanting to master the task, but they're also wanting to do it a little bit their own way. And if they have an idea in their head of how they're going to do it and they don't quite get the outcomes that they were hoping for, then you might be faced with that resistance or those outbursts of, I can't do it, it's too hard, I'm just stupid. And um, just tell you that that is actually all completely age appropriate behavior. So how do we support children at this stage um, in the learning process? Learning takes place on an emotional platform. So if our child is not calm and alert, they're going to struggle to learn. So an argument with a sibling or a parent before a task is not going to be helpful. Tears and tantrums at this stage can still be age appropriate up until the age of nine. Thereafter, I would say it's no longer that attractive. So we need to start by listening and addressing the emotion. What is your child trying to tell you? What is the need behind the emotion that you are seeing presenting right now? And they will often struggle to express this to you. And so we need to use that superhuman parenting skill of patience in helping to break it down with them. Um, so start by saying, you seem really upset about this task. They'll even tell you yes, or they'll tell you, no, I'm not upset about this task. It's a stupid task and I can't do it. Well, they've corrected you and now you know exactly how they are feeling about the task. So for me, then the implied message would be, mom, I actually don't know how to start the task. And that's then maybe a strategy for you of, of how to assist them in breaking the task down into small pieces and how to go about doing it. That way the child has a sense of control again, they're in a calm alert space and able to tackle the task and hopefully get a really positive outcome for all of you. Many families are reporting that their children are having outbursts and meltdowns. We have learned from experience that a change in behaviour and meltdowns occur when a child feels overwhelmed by their feelings or their surroundings. If this is the case, we shouldn't really be surprised that our children are having outbursts given the very challenging and changing times we are living in. A meltdown is a symptom. It's a sign that your children or your child is struggling with emotions he or she can't regulate. These emotions are normally that of anger and or anxiety. Anger, they feel that they're being denied something. And anxiety, they don't really know what's going on inside their own bodies and outside. Doctors always say we should treat the cause and not the symptom. So talk to your child. Talk to your child about your feelings about situa the situations. And talk to your child about their feelings and validate their feelings for them. Also, give them age appropriate information about what's going on around them. Children have the most amazing skill of hearing pieces of conversation that you don't want them to hear. If you call them to do some work, they don't hear you. But if you start having a conversation with a friend on the telephone, they suddenly hear everything. The only problem is they make their own interpretations and they only hear half of the conversation. So it's far better that they hear the correct information from you. When you're having these discussions, set limits and give 
enforceable consequences. Set consequences that you know that you're going to be able to follow through on. And I always believe that knowing what the consequences are to inappropriate behavior can help you make the right decision or the right choice. There's an old saying that goes, you can't play the game if you don't know the rules. So what do you do if your child does have the big M, the meltdown? Well, first of all, stay calm or fake it. Speak with a calm voice, be direct, use clear specific um, commands. It's far too late once they're having the meltdown to have those meaningful discussions. It is important for us to find practical ways we can help our children regulate or deal with their emotions. For younger children, it is helpful to teach them about the various emotions and to identify these emotions on an emotion chart or by playing with emotion cubes. Discuss these with your children. Share times when they or you have felt all of these emotions and why. Playing games is a perfect tool to help our children learn these skills and to develop their emotions. These skills also help them to become more self-aware, develop more positive relationships, show empathy towards others, use self-control, resolve conflicts easier and make more positive decisions. We can learn self-regulation skills in the same way we learn any other skill, with practice. Rather than saying to a child, I'm seeing this behavior all the time, we can rather say, we have to practice the skills so that next time we react more positively to the situation. It also changes the tone and content of the feedback you give your children. Another key to learning self-regulation skills is not to avoid difficult situations, but to coach our children through them and provide a supportive framework. For example, if they have a tough maths problem, let them work through the problem, discuss a starting point with them, and then leave them alone. Check in on them at intervals, offer guidance, give them a break if they need it, but keep praising them for their efforts. If a child is prone to melting down when they're asked to, for example, stop playing a video game, you might want to practice transitioning away from a game. You would want to practice with a game in which they're not overly invested. You don't want to begin with too high stakes. Have them practice playing for two or three minutes and then ask them to hand you the controller or start a new activity. Again, give lots of praise or a small reward of sorts for their compliance. It's important to remember that when parents and teachers approach impulsive, inappropriate behavior calmly, give our children time and guidance they can learn to choose better ways to respond to a situation. We should strive to give our children feedback which is non-judgmental and non-emotional. Determine what went wrong, why and how we can fix it next time. When children are part of an environment that is reflective as opposed to emotional and fast-paced, they can learn to make better choices. Slowing down allows children to become more thoughtful, reflective and self-aware. We need to slow down and model self-reflection and self-regulation for our children and it is also helpful and good for us too. If you would like any further information about games, ideas or just need some more support, please contact us at the following email addresses.